I've heard you say this on a few uh, interviews or podcasts and on, on the media, a million dollars for Bitcoin. Walk us through your thesis of how it could get there. I just don't think that enough people have a big enough imagination of this upcoming cycle I'm expecting. I mean, the bond market is in trouble. Who owns bonds? All of our banks. So our our bank deposits aren't there because the bonds that <laughs> were purchased with my deposit is underwater. And so if central banks and government is going to try and save that market, the amount of liquidity that's needed is going to send assets very high. I'm very pleased to be joined by Jack Maulers today. He is a founder and CEO of Strike. It's a system that lets everyone use Bitcoin to make daily payments on the Lightning Network, uh, which allows up to a million transactions per second. It's been called a revolutionary idea, concept, product. It's supposed to change the way we interact with not just Bitcoin, but money itself. We'll talk more about that. Uh, I've had Michael's Sailor on the show, um, MicroStrategy CEO. Last year, he was telling us about how uh, Lightning is the future, and you know people can check out that clip. For example, if you wanted to move $100 right now, there's no way you should be doing it on a Bitcoin base layer. Anybody that wants to move $100, $50, buy a cup of coffee, $25, even $250, you should be doing that with Lightning. Jack was listed on the Forbes 30 under 30 in 2021. He's also helped make Bitcoin legal tender in El Salvador. So definitely a household name in the Bitcoin and crypto sectors. Welcome back, Jack. Great to meet you. We've met in person once, I was telling you offline, but great to reconnect online in my interview. So thank you for being here. David, I appreciate you having me. You got to introduce me in my life more often, man. I got to bring you around. That was very <laughs> nice to you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to host you. Um, let's talk about strike. You've got an upcoming announcement um, about an expansion plan that we need to inform the public about. Uh, but first, I want to get your views on Bitcoin and what's been going on with this rally. A lot of people are concerned that this rally is going to be short-lived. It's you know short-term euphoria. Every time we've had a, uh, a high to a past high, Bitcoin has seen a correction. And we're starting to see a little bit of that. It's pulled back to $60,000. What is your take on this rally? Is this the beginning of a new bull run, run or is this just short-term hype? Um, I'll answer that in two parts. Uh, I'm a long-term holder of Bitcoin, and I, I have the opinion that Bitcoin's been in a bull market for 15 years. Uh, the highs have always been higher, and the lows have always been higher. And I think more of the world is waking up to the idea that if you've got one currency that's fixed in supply, and then you've got another currency that's being rapidly inflated in supply, then the one that's fixed in supply is going to appreciate in price against the one that's being inflated. And so I think Bitcoin is going to go up against the dollar and more and more people are subscribing to that thesis. So it doesn't shock me that Bitcoin is the best performing asset again this year. I think the narrative that we're living through right now is my favorite metric is global debt to GDP. Uh, the way I like to think about that is the amount of borrowing our governments have done from our future versus the growth they're producing to pay that back. And so we've borrowed a tremendous amount of time and energy from our future in the form of money with no way of paying it back. And that loss has to be realized somewhere. And I think the market is waking up to the idea that the government and central banks around the world are planning to realize that loss through debasing the currency. And you're seeing that in inflation metrics all the way down to New York City. And so if that's the case, uh, it's a race to own hard assets and Bitcoin's the hardest, most advanced money we've come across in human history. And so I think the recent rally, the adoption of an ETF on Wall Street, a lot of the narrative is they're going to socialize the loss of global debt's GDP and all the deficits through inflating the currency. And uh, you better not own dollars. And if you're going to own something, why not Bitcoin? And I think this is the broader theme of our conversation today is the adoption of Bitcoin long term. At what point, Jack, do you think Bitcoin is going to start trading like its own asset and become independent of the Nasdaq, for example? As you know, it's been very well correlated with tech stocks. Well, I think um, I, I like the Arthur Hayes quote of Bitcoin's price equals technology plus fiat liquidity. So it is a technological revolution. It's an innovation. Satoshi Nakamoto solved a computer science problem that was perceived to be insolvable before. And so the technology is valuable and the technology becomes more valuable. The more it gets adopted, the more it provides utility to consumers and there's network effects and economies of scale and all of those buzzwords. But then there's the fiat liquidity piece. And so Bitcoin seems to trend with liquidity cycles within the broader macro environment 
within the central bank environment. And so I think it will always, at least in the nearest term, have some correlation to the liquidity available in the market. The funny part about today, David, is high interest rates in America seem to be inflationary. Low interest rates seem to be inflationary. The deficits are just too big that everything's inflationary, which I think has resulted in Bitcoin just trending up no matter what. But I do expect it to be relatively correlated. It'll take some time. So just broad macro question then, do you expect that inflation to continue staying sticky? In other words, it's not going to come down to the Fed's 2% target anytime soon? Oh, no chance. I, as soon as SVB collapsed, I said that 2% target, you kiss that goodbye. They're going to start to socialize and normalize the idea that, well, what's, what's the difference between 2 and 3? What's the difference between 2 and 20? Yeah. Uh, I think that government, it's an election year, government has a decision to make. Do you want bank lines or do you want inflation to run hot? Because your entire banking system is insolvent. Uh, and if you're going to save them and bail them out and fix this bond market, then you're going to have to let inflation run hot. And neither is a good solution. But as a government, you got to pick one. And I think historically, governments and empires have picked inflation running hot. They're not going to. If they wanted Jamie Dimon to go to jail for running an insolvent bank, if you run Bank of America's numbers, they're technically insolvent. Uh, they could have thrown him in jail in 2008. Uh, that's not how they do it. So I expect inflation to run hot and the currency to be debased. You use the words hard asset to describe Bitcoin. Can you just elaborate mm -hmm. on what you mean by that? Yeah, hard. It's a simple concept. It's the hardest to produce. So how hard okay. is it to make more of it? So uh, housing is harder than dollars because it's harder to create more housing than dollars. But Bitcoin's the hardest money of all because it's the only money that has a scarce fixed supply. So in my opinion, Bitcoin is the most advanced money ever created in human history because it's the hardest money. And money tends and trends to be one. And the one it finds is the hardest, the hardest to make more of because it's then the the easiest way to persist and store value through time and space. Well, the halving which has happened theoretically is supposed to have pushed up mining costs. It's supposed to have, um, well, not supposed to, but it did decrease uh, the amount of Bitcoin's mine per day by half. Right? Why didn't the price react accordingly? Why didn't we see a huge spike immediately afterward, which was a couple of days ago? Yeah, you know, I got a different take than maybe you'd read online of the sure. having. Uh, this is my third having as a Bitcoiner. I've been in the space 11 years. Uh, I think of it as an inventory reduction, like a commodity inventory reduction. I don't think it's something that the market can necessarily price in or not price in. I think, think of it like there's one natural seller in the market and that's the commodity producer. That's the miner. They have a commodity premium. There's a cost to produce the asset. And in order to pay down the cost that they intake in producing it, they sell the finished good that they produce. And if that is going to be reduced by 50%, then the cushion, the natural sellers are reduced by half. So all that means to me is the cushion that the market has to enter new price discovery is just significantly less. If for whatever reason, there's a newfound demand cycle, like interest rates lower or some new nation state adopts Bitcoin, whatever that is, you're going to enter price discovery in a lot more violent fashion. So I just consider it an inventory reduction just like the 88 drought for agriculture commodities. And that's why I think you ch tend to see cyclical behavior that follow the halving is because there's less cushion and less padding for the market to take on new demand. Okay. And what does this mean ultimately for the miners? Are we expecting the miners to be able to survive in an environment where the costs are significantly higher over time, not just because of the halving, but also keep in mind they have to compete with AI companies now for the same data centers. So perhaps their fixed costs are going to go up. Yeah. I think I'll separate that one into two questions sure. as well. One is Bitcoin's going to survive no matter what. The protocol actually adjusts to how many miners are on the network. And that's one of the innovations. The difficulty adjustment is arguably Satoshi's most clever invention. So the Bitcoin network doesn't care. The actual mining business, I think, has got to be one of the most cutthroat, tough industries in the world. From the highest level possible, you are competing against every human on the planet for energy, which is the currency of the universe. So I think that that is just an impossible industry to master. And there are likely going to be miners that have a really difficult time. There's likely going to be miners that are really successful. And like you said, energy is consumed not just in Bitcoin. I mean, human flourishing has a correlation to energy. Our, our ability to commercialize energy from the sun is what humanity's all about. And so I think it's just a cutthroat industry, no matter how you slice it.
We're going to continue with Jack Marler's Bitcoin price forecast and his expansion plans for Strike. But first, a quick shout out to our sponsor, iTrust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets in the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1%. If you're over 18 and you want to open a new account with cash or roll over an existing account, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below with the QR code over here to get started and learn more. And if you use my referral link, you get $100 of a sign-up bonus once you fund your account. Okay, uh, turning back to Bitcoin itself, I've heard you say this on a few uh, interviews or podcasts and on other media, a million dollars for Bitcoin. Walk us through your thesis of how it could get there. I just don't think that enough people have a big enough imagination of this upcoming cycle I'm expecting. I mean, the bond market is in trouble uh, for really arguably the first time in modern financial history, bondholders are getting absolutely demolished and crushed. Now, David, who owns bonds? All of our banks. So our our bank deposits aren't there because the bonds that <laughs> were purchased with my deposit is underwater. And so if central banks and government is going to try and save that market, the amount of liquidity that's needed is going to send assets very high. I mean, you can try and do napkin math. And I, I joke, like, how many COVIDs are we going to get if they try and bail out this market that we're in today? You may get two, three COVIDs. So if that happens, it's impossible to speculate on an asset as scarce as Bitcoin. But I think 250000 to a million is the imagination I have in that range of just how big this can get. And that's based on all the liquidity that's going to be required to make this market solvent. Is that based on uh, a steepening of the adoption curve, which we'll talk about in just a minute, or is that just based on normal market action, like more liquidity, like you, like you mentioned, and the natural course of time just passing? Like, what, what is a catalyst is basically what I'm asking. I think all the above. Well, you're, we're talking about pricing Bitcoin in a piece of paper that's being actively debased, right? Okay, so sure. maybe a more interesting question is, you know, how many houses can I get for my Bitcoins in yes. a year? Um, but Given the fact that it is in dollars, I think that's where your imagination has to go insanely high because of the predicament that the government is in. On the other side of that, though, on the the talk of adoption and just the notion of it, I think price is the most accurate KPI we have into Bitcoin adoption. What price tells me is a rather accurate measurement of how much of the world is using Bitcoin as money. And so I expect more of the world to take on Bitcoin as money, whether it be for any form of use case or value to them, because it is so appealing and solving so many different problems. So I expect adoption of Bitcoin as, as a monetary unit to go up. Mm -hmm. And then against the dollar in particular and other fiat currencies, I expect it to be violent to the upside. Okay. Well, I, I think the follow-up question to your view is, look, the Lightning Network was created to solve the problem of a slower transaction speed for Bitcoin, right? But why would you, just philosophically speaking, use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange at all if you believe it's going to go much higher to 250000 or a million dollars, whatever the target may be? Why wouldn't I just hodl it as a store of value? Yeah, well, so a guy like me, I'm so convicted. I actually don't even own dollars anymore. I only own Bitcoin, so I have to spend it because it's the only money I own. But my thesis there is I spend on credit cards because I get to borrow a currency that only goes down and spend without owning it. And then I own the very hardest money that is the best performing asset in human history. So I'm running a short dollar trade in my everyday life, which sure. so I have to I have to spend Bitcoin. Um, so that's why I do. But I also, I mean, we as a business, we have a product line that moves fiat currencies over the Lightning Network. So we take a little bit of a separate view and, and view that part of Bitcoin as a payments network. And I agree with you. There are customers of ours that don't want to spend Bitcoin, but they do value faster, cheaper global payments. And so that is the part where the technology is actually disruptive in creating new value and disrupting existing businesses. I've never seen an asset that is so conflicted in its actual use case uh, as Bitcoin. <laughs> I, it, you talk to five different people, I get like at least three different answers as to exactly why one should own Bitcoin, right? There's a lot of critics out there who don't necessarily agree with your view in particular, right? Which is that Bitcoin should be used as payment. Some people think it's just too volatile a, an asset. Why would I pay for something that moves up and down the way it does, right? It's just not yeah. useful as a currency. How would you respond to that? Well, um, so I think... I'd agree. I, th I mean, I, th I view Bitcoin as pure humanity in the sense that it's one of the only free markets we have left. 
And so I love the idea that people can do whatever they want with Bitcoin. So if someone says, I don't want to spend it because all it does is go up. Well, I'll shake your hand. Good for you. You might be right. But uh, there's the concept, David, in Bitcoin of capital Bitcoin, capital B Bitcoin and lowercase b Bitcoin. Lowercase b Bitcoin is when we are referencing the monetary unit, the actual bear asset. Capital B Bitcoin is when we're referencing the network. Mm. What I mean by that is take gold, for example, which Bitcoin is compared to all the time. What is gold's monetary network? It's us human beings. If I wanted to move gold across the world, I'd have to get off my butt, put it in my pocket, get on an airplane and drop it off wherever I needed it to go. Bitcoin actually has a network associated with it as well. And that's distinct separate value. So you could say that maybe Bitcoin, the unit can be competitive to the bond market or the real estate market or dollar. Bitcoin, the network can be competitive to Swift, can be competitive to Visa. It's an entirely different value proposition. So that to me, we can move fiat currencies over that. Why can't I move a dollar euro trade over the Bitcoin network instead of the Swift network? And so I don't disagree with you whatsoever. I think the technology is valued independently of your personal spending preference. Well, more broadly, um, in regards to your philosophy of what Bitcoin is, you said in a January interview that Bitcoin is the only innovation that can solve the biggest financial problem ever, which is central banking. Uh, what, what did you mean by that? Um, Just that there's a group of people that... Could, so I think of, listen, I think of money as time and energy in an abstracted form. It's abstracted into a market good. But that's what money is. It's a market good that you don't buy to consume for its own sake, but you buy to then exchange later. So you work really hard, David, on this podcast. And what in return for that, you get money. Yeah. The fact that there is a central bank that can debase the value of your money means they can debase the value of your time and energy. And so it is a very real threat to society. Uh, and so I view central banking and the manipulation of currency to be a central party that can manipulate society and human tendencies. And I think that you've been able to see that over the last hundred years since fiat currency, this latest iteration of the dollar has been introduced. I think it's caused a lot of problems. So I view Bitcoin as a, a solution to that. Do you think Bitcoin is becoming more centralized because of, well, the Bitcoin ETFs, which allows large institutions to basically buy in theory, a majority of the Bitcoin float. I mean, wouldn't that create a central bank for Bitcoin, so to speak? No. Uh, so it's a common misconception and sure. it's a great question. Uh, Bitcoin is not proof of stake. So that might very well be true for something like Ethereum. Bitcoin operates with proof of work. So, and, and you tell me if you want to get into that, sure. but what that means from a high level is that uh, the it doesn't matter how much you own of the actual asset itself. It gives you no further influence on the on the wider network. So someone that owns no Bitcoin versus someone that owns all the Bitcoins has the same opportunity and chance to mine the next Bitcoin block. They have to follow the same rules and consensus protocol on the network itself. So it doesn't matter the percentage that anyone entity owns over the network. It's distributed in ways that don't account for a person's holdings. Okay. Um, another argument I've heard against uh, the Bitcoin's um, limited supply argument, which is that it's capped at 21 million, therefore it has value there. You can just fork Bitcoin to infinity, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's your counter argument to that? Uh, forking Bitcoin is uh, creating a new asset. Uh, I like the analogy of chess. Have you ever played chess, David? Sure. Yeah. I'm not very good at it, but <laughs> I understand the rules. <laughs> I love. Yeah. I love the game. So let's say you and I are playing a game of chess yeah. and you're kicking my butt. And then I fork the game and say, my pawns are now allowed to move like queens. Right. And then I checkmate you. Well, that we we decided to then not play chess. We're playing Jack's chess or we're playing Jack and David's chess or we're playing the Tuesday night chess or the chess we play when we have a bunch of beers. That's a different game. And so Bitcoin is defined by the consensus rules, the parameters of the system, and that's enforced by the distributed network. So you can fork it and create a different asset, but you can't inflate the supply of the currency that operates within the consensus rules just says you could change the rules of chess, but you're just creating a different board game. You can't, you know, inflate the rules of chess, the rules of the rules. Uh, okay. So a hard fork on Bitcoin wouldn't change the fundamental um, 
core argument of Bitcoin is having a limited supply is what you're saying. Yeah, and we've yeah, and we've already seen that. We've seen these iterations of Bitcoin Cash, there's Bitcoin Gold, there's Bitcoin faster version, Bitcoin inflated version, Bitcoin smart contract version, and these are just different assets that end up trading and being valued at zero. So, I view generally the altcoin space and all the Bitcoin forks forks to be arbitrages on the trend in my opinion. Uh, I don't view them as valuable whatsoever. And we've we've seen this play out. And uh, yeah, y- y- the, the main point is you can't change Bitcoin's rules. Uh, the distributed network protects against that. And if you do, you create a new asset class. You don't inflate the existing one. Okay, um, let's move on and talk about Bitcoin as a form of payment, which ultimately is um, one of the... Um problems that your company is trying to solve or enhance. I mean, do we do we know why Bitcoin is not wi- as widely used as, let's say, fiat? I mean, you've made very mm-hmm. compelling arguments as to why it's a superior form of money in many ways. Yeah, I think, and I mean, we see this in the growth of our own business. Our payments business is growing and doing well, but our biggest business line is customers buying and selling Bitcoin. I think the the biggest use case for Bitcoin today is it stores value across time mm. better than any other asset. And that's the killer use case that even Wall Street is subscribed to today. And so that is what's carrying the adoption. And that's why people don't spend it is because they buy it to hold it. Uh, I also do think on the payment side, we see a lot more interest in adoption oftentimes for cross-currency payments, cross-border payments, because there's real friction there. The issue is changing consumer behavior is very, very challenging and very, very difficult. And so we see the payments line in that business, it grows in a slower adoption cycle than someone in Nigeria whose currency is being rapidly debased and they need something else to hold because they're basically dying and they need a life raft. The central bank is sucking the time and energy out of their life. Well, when when you first got involved with strike right when you when you first had this business idea what was ultimately the problem you wanted to solve so when i founded the company initially it was based on the lightning network's idea of i i view it as an open value transfer protocol on the internet and so what i believe the world desperately needs is a neutral value transfer protocol that can get a neutral value instrument anywhere in the world in less than a second and at no cost and people often think that that implies spending and using Bitcoin and there's all this volatility, but we actually can move a dollar over that value transfer protocol or a euro or a pound or a Naira. And it opens up new cross-currency markets that were previously impossible because of the cost. So you can do micro payments and internet tipping, and it greatly enhances and disrupts existing ones that are very cost prohibitive. So that was the initial thing that brought me to El Salvador. The way the business has evolved is we've turned into one of the best in the world at Bitcoin, period, Uh, especially after the fall of FTX and SAM. I mean, we are one of the most licensed, regulated, globally accessible Bitcoin financial service providers and, in my opinion, have some of the best technology in the world. And a lot of customers come to us for all Bitcoin, buying it, selling it, storing it, sending it, receiving it, payments. We have developer products and APIs. So we're a one-stop Bitcoin shop at this point. But my initial thesis was that the world needed a business that really focused a lot more on Bitcoin and less on speculative crypto exchange because there's a lot more of the technology within Bitcoin that we can advance humanity with. And I didn't see, I saw a hole in the market there. I saw a lot of crypto exchanges with leverage and not a lot of Bitcoin financial service firms that were dead focused on taking Bitcoin as far as it can go. Okay. Uh, Speaking of Bitcoin as a form of payment, Bitcoin used to be used predominantly as a form of payment before the advent of stable coins. And I think a lot of, I've, I've talked to several um, uh, payment vendors and and platforms, and they've told me that it's now 80-20 stable coin versus Bitcoin for, for B2P transactions, whereas a couple of years ago it was reverse, mm-hmm. right? Um, why do you think that trend happened? Oh, I think Bitcoin volatility is a user experience problem in payments. Um, the way we solve that is by moving fiat currencies over the Bitcoin network so that you can spend a dollar using this neutral value transfer protocol, but yeah. uh, stable coins solve that user experience problem. So I believe that's the primary driver. Uh, I think people conflate the idea that stable coins compete with the lightning network. Stable coin is an asset. It's a Euro dollar product. It's not a network, sure. um, but I think they're going to eventually be complementary. but I think that's 
the primary driver. So for the viewers out there watching this who may not be familiar with the Lightning Network, um, let, let's explain how maybe it works. So one of the fundamental problems of using Bitcoin with the criticism of using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange is let's say I go to a store and buy my coffee with Bitcoin. It's a slow protocol to transact with. Lightning fixes this problem how? Uh, it takes the payments off of the blockchain. So the Bitcoin blockchain has to be slow because it accounts for the reality of physics, things like the speed of light. So every single Bitcoin payment you make on the blockchain, you have to announce to the world. The world has to receive that message, validate it, incorporate it, and mine it into the blockchain. And that takes time. The Lightning Network takes Bitcoin, which is a broadcast protocol. So you're broadcasting to the whole world and it turns it into a link to link protocol where you're just broadcasting to your direct counterpart. And if you're just talking to one person, then things become a lot faster and a lot cheaper. So it's what we call a layer two in the industry, but it effectively allows Bitcoin payments to be made instantly and at little to no cost. Okay. And what what does the end end user have to do to 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 make this happen? Does he have to download some sort of software? Does he have to use it through an app or does he have to transact Bitcoin only through the strike network? Yeah, hopefully nothing, right? Like um, there's a lot of layers of the internet. In fact, yeah. you know, there's maybe seven, um, but all you need to do is download a browser. So we as a financial service provider build wallets that build all of this in-house so that it feels and looks like a cash app or a Venmo. But of course, if you wanted to build your own internet stack yourself at home, you can. You can be your own ISP. And so consumers can set it all up. But nowadays, you just download a Bitcoin wallet, a Lightning wallet, and those that support the features, it it works out of the box. Um, I mean, just to give a comparison to the viewers, I believe, and correct me if I got the numbers wrong, but I believe that the Bitcoin layer one transaction speed is roughly around seven transactions per second, whereas Lightning can now operate up to a million or more uh, in some cases, right? So, I mean, does this, yep. has, this, has, has this caused some regulatory challenges around how much of an improvement this is over the layer one? No, um, I think that this is just the biggest showcase of programmable money. Right. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin's going to get better forever because engineers are never done. So it's just about the coolest thing in the world that we have a global money that we can work on. And so I think we'll continue to extend the functionality. And this is only the beginning, in my opinion. Unfortunately, us humans can't live forever to see it. But uh, it's 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 great. It's great. Well, well tell, tell us about the next steps for Strike and how your expansion could lead to the concept of hyper Bitcoinization, which is that at some point, this is an idea, it's a fantasy, but it could happen. It's at some point, everyone in the world could use Bitcoin for something, right? We're not there yet, but how could Strike help us get there? Yeah. Well, so with Europe, we're in almost a hundred markets. And I think the difference between our product and maybe something like a bigger exchange is one, we focus only on Bitcoin because we think Bitcoin is the innovation and the actual only money within the crypto space. And then two, we treat it as money. So our product is a wallet and we focus on your ability to acquire it or sell it if you live on it. And then your ability to store it and move it as opposed to trade it. Uh, we do not consider ourselves an exchange more so than a money app. And so right. we believe that more of the world is going to adopt Bitcoin as money because it is better money, it's harder money. And we see that in our own growth and our own numbers. And so the future I'd love to see is that we are one of the many players that provide financial services to the new world reserve currency. How do you just convince people to start using Bitcoin as a form of payment? I'll give you an example. Okay, so you've mentioned El Salvador, where you were um, involved in. This is an article from Science, um, Science Magazine. Uh, they've concluded, uh, this is a long... Uh, paper, but they've concluded here in the abstract that Bitcoin adoption in El Salvador has been rather weak so far. Uh, one of the issues that a lot of people don't yet trust Bitcoin as a form of payment. Uh, the study finds that Bitcoin adoption is strongest in young, educated men, um, banked men for that matter, people with bank accounts. Um, most respondents didn't know what Bitcoin even is or, or, or does. So even though it is legal tender in Bitcoin, not everyone still uses it on a regular basis. What would you say to those people not yet using Bitcoin? Um, well, I think this kind of comes back to the idea we were talking about earlier, that changing consumer behavior at that level is very challenging and difficult. Um, but on a in wider scope, I think El Salvador 
adopting Bitcoin has been a huge success. My favorite story is the government's treasury of Bitcoin and the fact that I actually don't know the Bitcoin price when the government of El Salvador can call the IMF and say, yeah. hey guys, it was nice knowing you, but uh, I'm going to end the relationship. But um, I, I don't know. I mean, what I would say to the people is, I mean, if I were to walk down to a corner store, I guess, and no one was accepting Bitcoin yet, I would say, listen, it's a new payments network that gives you access to new customers and there are no chargebacks. It's cash final. There's no interchange. And by the way, if you want to use a service provider like us, we'll cash final settle it in any currency you want if you don't want to hold Bitcoin and be exposed to the volatility. So if you mark it up property by property, it's better than a visa. There's no interchange. There's no chargebacks. It's cash final. It's open and interoperable with any service. So you can accept a lightning payment from Cash App, from soon to be Coinbase, from my customers. So as a payments provider in a network, it's hit hand over heels better. Uh, but I think changing consumer behavior at that level is difficult. Uh, I think the adoption you're seeing from Bitcoin more organically is people that are tired of getting poorer through currency debasement. <laughs> okay. But you, you, okay. So going back to you, you mentioned that you transact mostly in Bitcoin, correct? How do you, how do you, how do you physically do that in your everyday life? Yeah. So I'm almost running and we're going to launch products around this in a bit. Um, I'm almost running the Michael Saylor trade personally. So what I do, I only own Bitcoin and I spend on credit. So I spend, it's what, Sailor does. You borrow the weaker currency okay. and hoard harder currency. So I have a credit, I have credit cards and I spend on those. And right. then when I need to pay those down, I sell the Bitcoin to pay them off. I, you know, I do bill pay with Bitcoin, but in that way I'm borrowing the currency that only goes down. So I get to spend it without ever needing to hold it. And I hoard the currency that averages going up 50 to hundred percent year over year. So everything around me gets 50 to 100% cheaper year over year, right? It gets a half off every single year. Uh, and I spend on a credit line of the currency that's getting actively debased by my government. So I'm just running a short trade all the way down to the penny. Okay. And um, and are, are you okay? What has what, what, what your bank said about this? <laughs> um, they haven't said anything. Um, so far, so good. I don't know. Um, I, I can't imagine that they have, I don't know, maybe they'll watch this interview and they'll give me a call, but- um, Yeah, I think the broader I question is, I think the banks will start using your method, right? They'll start opening up avenues for people to also adopt Bitcoin, use transactions with Bitcoin, take loans using Bitcoin. At what point do you think the TradFi institutions will start catching up on this trend, Jack? Well, I'd be curious what they're going to do about it. It, I think that if this gets adopted like a GameStop, Robinhood type situation, you're going to run the banking institutions in the U.S. insolvent. Mm -hmm. If we all hoard Bitcoin and spend on a credit line of credit cards, yeah. then banks are going to go under. Um, but it's very obviously the financially responsible thing to do. You know, when my buddies are like, you know, how could you possibly do that? I look them in the eye and say, why would I own something that only goes down? That's the US dollar. So if I, if the bank is going to give me a line of credit and I can afford to not have to own it and I get to own and hoard the thing that only goes up, you know, I'm a college dropout, David, but that's a very simple trade. And so, and so I don't know, I, I, you know, we're hopeful at Strike to launch some products that make this a lot easier and more user-friendly. And I'm really curious to see the adoption rate of it because yeah. I think it's obvious. Uh, wh what do you think would incentivize merchants at local businesses to start accepting payments with Bitcoin? Um, we, we see it and we work on it. It it grows slower than those that want to buy Bitcoin, like I said. Yeah. But when people adopt it, it's because one, you're acquiring new customers. So merchants aren't married to the Visa network or the MasterCard network. They want customers to spend money at their store. So it acquires a new sector of customers. The payments network is cash final. So chargebacks are some of the biggest costs that merchants uh, occur when selling goods and services on the internet. So there's no chargebacks. It's cash final. It's a physical instrument that settles in real time. And it's a lot cheaper because there's less intermediaries to broker the finality of the transaction. So it's cheaper, it's faster, it's cash final, and you get to acquire a new sector of customers. And for all of those reasons, or a few of those reasons, we see merchants pick it up more and more. Does Strike allow you to have the option to, let's say, convert Bitcoin to fiat instantly at a merchant? Yeah. So we allow customers to send fiat currencies over the Lightning Network and allow, whether it's consumers or acquirers or anyone, to receive fiat currencies over. So, for example, in our launch with Europe, 
our dollar euro market. So we allow then by na- by nature of having a BTC USD product and then a BTC EUR product by proxy, we have a USD EUR product. And that product is actually significantly cheaper than TransferWise, which the world will know as we launch. So um, we allow cross-currency payments or p- payments to be acquired in local currency without ever touching Bitcoin. So everyone kind of gets the best of both worlds. You can get the benefits of the network without touching the asset, or you can get all the asset and the network. So so just to clarify, would I be able to, let's say, if I have Bitcoin with Strike, uh, and then I go to, like let's say, a McDonald's, I tap my phone, I take the Bitcoin out from Strike, and it instantly converts to $3 for my Big Mac or whatever. Yeah. Right? Would that, that, that's how, how long would that process take? Less than a it's second? It's instantly. Instantly. Yeah, okay. yeah. So if you think about it, um, let's go through. So if I was, uh, I love cross-currency uh, transfers because yeah. they've got the most friction. It's the easiest to understand. Let's say that uh, I want to send 10 US dollars to Nigeria. What Strike's going to do is, well, how much Bitcoin is 10 US dollars worth in our system of BTC USD? So we're interconnected with the rest of the market and we're going to get an amount of Bitcoin. Then we'll, what is that amount of Bitcoin worth in Naira? And we're able to send that Bitcoin to any counterpart in Africa in less than a second and at no cost. And so then what you're what you're seeing is Bitcoin is almost like the translator, like in Google Translate, um, right? Like you take one language, you put it into Google's Translate interpreter, and then it comes out as a different language. With cross-currency, you take one currency, you put it into Bitcoin, and then it comes out as another currency. And so that's how you get like a dollar Naira market that's 50% cheaper than the rest, than like using the SWIFT network and clearing through central banks. Does that make sense? And so- Yeah, it does, yeah. Just, we're just trading Bitcoin, right? Like sending dollars over- Lightning is a BTC USD buy order because I'm taking the customer's dollars and I'm sending Bitcoin out and acquiring as a sell order. I, I think one of the concerns that a lot of Bitcoiners have had since the collapse of FTX and Celsius and a bunch of others is that, you know, the, you know the phrase "not your keys, not your Bitcoin," and people mm-hmm. are at, have been advocating to use wallets for that particular reason. I know Strike is not a wallet; it's a custodial service, so people don't actually own their keys through Strike. So, how would you mm-hmm. respond to people with those concerns? That they don't actually oh. own any Bitcoin through Strike. You know, you ultimately you control the keys, right? Uh, yeah, we do. I would say take it off the platform, uh, and we'll help you and, and encourage you to do that. I do believe that there's room for financial institutions in Bitcoin. I think, I mean, centralization provides efficiencies. There's no doubt about that. That's why AWS is the best place to run a server in the world is because it's centralized with Amazon. If we had to run a distributed AWS, it wouldn't work. Um, And so the idea of distributed or decentralization is very valuable when trying to elect a monetary policy for the world to agree on. But for financial services, I think centralization in some parts is okay. And then that's what we see in our growth and our customers. But I would say if you're not cool with that, then uh, hit withdraw and we'll process it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Finally, what's next for strike besides your european expansion are you are you thinking of the entire world or are you just limiting it to you know certain jurisdictions for now whatever you can comment on at this point yeah we're thinking the entire world i can comment and say uh, the uk is the next market and we expect that to land within this quarter uh the way i i kind of open with this the way i think about it is global debt to gdp is so ludicrous and the whole world, the collective governments have borrowed so much from our future, no way to pay it back and everyone needs Bitcoin. And so as a Bitcoin financial service provider and someone that holds the conviction in the future of this technology saving us and providing us hope, we wanna be as accessible and available to everyone on the planet in what I think is the greatest wealth transfer of all time and the great reset and uh, the future of money. So we're just gonna keep our head down and keep going. If you had to guess which markets or which areas in the world would adopt Bitcoin the fastest as a form of payment? Would it be the developing countries or the developed G7 countries, for example? I think the developing. I think the developed, the Western world is going to adopt it uh, as a hedge against fiat debasement, like we're seeing on Wall Street, the store of value use case. I think Wall Street is leading this charge of Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, you know, they're sending gold to new highs and, and Bitcoin as well. And I think the developing uh, will adopt it more as a medium of exchange first. Finally, I have to, before I let you go, I have to get your thoughts on altcoins. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty broad. We won't have time to go through all the altcoins. Let's start with ETH, um, particularly. You've called it a tech play in the past. Uh, yep. 
Kathy Wood recently stated her love for ETH. She said just today in an article that she expects the cap to reach $20 trillion by 2032 um, with 120 <laughs> million tokens that equates to $166,000 per token. Um, she's basing this, this, the rationale is she's basing this on the fact that um, there's going to be massive adoption uh, with DeFi applications being built on ETH expanding. Can you comment on that? Um, I think she's wrong, I guess is the short answer, but um, I I do view, I don't think any of these altcoins are money, which is a subtle comment, but it means a lot. Um, Ethereum, Ethereum went through a DAO hack. I don't know if you're familiar, David, a long time ago where the protocol was hacked for hundreds of millions of dollars and they changed the monetary policy to protect the developers. And to me, that was the first instance of what has become many of a prioritization of being a technology that wants to be further adopted by developers and not a money that can be acted as the neutral base currency of the world. And so that's why I view Bitcoin as the only money that's come out of this sector and everything else as a technology. The reason I call it an arbitrage on the trend is if you want to build technology, that's fine. That's what I do at Strike. I built technology. I have Strike shares. That's a security. That's an equity. Um, the, the issue I have is why then do you need your own currency? That's when I think things get a little messed up is, oh yeah, I'm saving the world. Oh really? How do I get involved? Well, you buy the currency I created. Oh, <laughs> well, now I, now I start to disregard your opinion a little bit. You're just, it seems to be a, a less legally accountable way to be a central bank. Could you try as a, oh, sorry, that was serious. I think it's a, it's a less legally accountable way to be a central bank than it is uh, anything else. In my opinion, it's it's a lot of people's excuse to create their own money and and sell it to the public. So that's my brutally honest take on Ethereum. I think uh, that less legally accountable way is uh, now like the SEC is catching on to that. I think that's yeah. what they're taking issue with. So that's my opinion. I, I think it's an arbitrage on the trend and it won't last forever. You, you don't think that the argument that it's a deflationary asset, uh, meaning that it gets burned, um, isn't going to boost the value at some point? No, but it, it became deflationary when that's what everyone was kicking and screaming about. They switched to proof of stake when politicians were kicking and screaming about energy consumption. You know who else changes and launches features based on customer demand? Strike, Apple, Amazon, Facebook. Sure. These are companies. These are centralized entities. These are not, you know, distributed neutral. So, so you concerns. wouldn't you wouldn't consider building a strike on any other protocol besides Bitcoin? Uh no. And it's nonsensical. Oh, by the way, Strike, our servers run on centralized servers because we care about efficiency and sure. speed to customers, right? I think if you wanted to run a distributed network for some application, great. And you wanted to use money, I'd use Bitcoin. But if you're going to run a distributed network and then introduce your own currency, that's when I start to have questions for you. So what's the need for that if it's not to enrich enrich so, yourself? So, so what? how do you define a shitcoin? Um, I think a shitcoin is a currency that uh, was founded and distributed and has outside influence from a central group. Um, personally, like I don't think gold is necessarily a shitcoin. Yeah, uh, I I view the U.S. dollar as a shitcoin. I view Ethereum as a shitcoin. I view all the altcoins as shitcoins. Okay. Uh, is there anything that could, in your opinion, um, be the closest in solving the blockchain trilemma, scalability, security, um, what was the third one, uh, decentralization? Well, the problem I have is I think Bitcoin does a great job at it. You know, here's here's a, a mental exercise I think is interesting, yeah. David. In every single thing on planet earth with more supply, you find more demand. Yeah. The reason that I can't store my value in iPhones is I'll buy 10,000 iPhones today and then sell them for 10 X the price in 10 years. Cause the demand for iPhones is going to go up is because with more demand for iPhones, Apple can just produce more iPhones. So the price will never go up. Okay. The, oh, the, right. Uh, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So I, I think the, the only asset that uh, can actually solve of that is is Bitcoin. Um, B Bitcoin's the only asset and instrument where with more supply or with more demand, you cannot find more supply. Um, so I, I don't I, I don't know. I, I don't think uh, Bitcoin has I don't think any of these I guess my point is in Bitcoin with more demand, you can't find more supply, you get more shit coins. Sorry, I had right. to just cut to the chase there. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that what does we're make seeing, sense. 
what we're yeah. seeing in this industry is when there's more demand for this asset and for this technology, you can't inflate the Bitcoin. So what you do get is a bunch of shit coins and a bunch of arbitrages on the trend and a bunch of people that are trying to in inflate the revolution and innovation and yeah. sell it to the public. My final question before I let you go, Jack, great talk. What would change your mind about Bitcoin? Suppose something in our lifetimes happens such that you would give up on the idea of Bitcoin as a money, you would give up on the idea of Bitcoin as a hard asset, um, and you would move on to do something else with your business. What would that hypothetical event or series of events be? Mm. Well, I I believe money wants to be won and money tends to be the hardest. So if there were to be a harder form of money, I would adopt it along with the rest of the world logically. Uh, and so if there's a better money that humanity comes across or if Bitcoin becomes a worse money, but I view both of those as zero to no chance, at least within my lifetime. I think Bitcoin's that big of an innovation where this thing is going to last hundreds or thousands of years and I'm just lucky to be alive during the beginning. Wow. Okay, great. Where can we follow you, Jack? Learn about you? Learn about Strike? Oh, man, I'm all over the internet. I, that's where I spend all my time. I uh, I sit here on my computer and talk to guys like you. So I'm Jack Mallers on Twitter and everywhere else. And uh, yeah, Strike is available in close to 100 countries. So if you want to get the best out of Bitcoin, give it a try. Let us know what you think. All right, we'll put the links down in the description below. Make sure to give Jack a follow. Make sure to give strike a follow thank you very much for your time jack it's great honor meeting you likewise brother thanks for having me thank you thank you for watching don't forget to like and subscribe